So the guys next door to me are actually setting up an industrial kitchen and they popped around yesterday to ask me to look at this thing. This thing is a deep fat fryer. It's in a commercial industrial unit, freestanding with its own little counter. So these things cost quite a few hundred pounds and they picked it up for very little indeed with only one problem with it. It's broken. Now this sort of stuff actually is tremendously easy to repair and you can pick it up for just a few quid, no problem at all. What breaks in them is this in the back. This in the back is a bunch of um, quite old control electronics. So what I need to do really is take that stuff out and have a look at it. So let's get it out and get it onto the bench. So the main components actually lifted out really easily and it's pretty common in kitchen gear, which is really a heating appliance to have the same parts in them. We've got a heating unit here, which is basically just a coil. And this coil actually is in a bit of pipe the pipe is stuffed with an insulating material and the coil is inside of the pipe and that's what you can see at the ceramic contact here actually. So they're always a different shape but essentially exactly the same thing. So you have some kind of heating element. Now obviously we want to control that heating element, that is we want to supply it with some power, we want to read the temperature and when the temperature gets to where we want it to be we need to turn it off. So we've got our heating element, we need some kind of control box, we need some kind of off-on switch and some way of reading the temperature. And that's true of every single heating appliance down from a kettle to a toaster to an oven. They're all basically the same setup with the same logic that you need and the same bits in them. And we'll deal with that in a minute. But when we take these bits apart, we can see what was the core electronics within the actual fryer. So there is the thermocouple right there, and it's leading to this bit. This bit actually has no controls on it, but a big red button. So clearly that is the emergency cutoff. So there's the cutoff switch if you need to press it. And this will be set to some temperature where it would cut it off once that excess temperature was um, met. So that's the emergency system right there. Cutoff switch and a excess temperature reading. Then this was the main bit that was connected to the control knob. So this is obviously a little thermocouple and it'll be a bimetallic strip thermocouple of some description I'm guessing. And there is the sensor probe that went into the fat. So that's the one that you can control which is the one that you twiddle up and down to give you a different temperature. Now there was a bizarre thing with this which I kind of quite liked actually uh, and that was this thing. This is just a mechanical um, timer. It's not connected to anything, it just gives you a bing when the things are done, which I think is cool. So I'm going to re-put that back on so the, the lads get their bing back. So that one I'll save and put back on because it's not actually doing anything apart from giving you an audible warning some time is over. The main controls are these two here, which is what we're going to replace with new electronics and we'll show that in a minute. Now with reclaiming all of this stuff, what I'm smiling at is it's actually disgusting. <laughs> with reclaiming all of this stuff, in particular kitchen gear, it's almost invariably uh, stainless steel when it's commercial. So it cleans up beautifully. And it's almost invariably covered in old food, old fat and thick layers of grease, which is exactly what this is. So removing all of that stuff was a quite horrible job, actually, because it mostly was sticking to it and then sticking to me. I can't tell you how many screws I've had stuck to my fingers. But you do need to remove it because, of course, it is commercial kitchen. It is going back into preparing food. So the whole thing needs cleaning. And you can see it's actually relatively gunky. But it's stainless steel, so it's dead easy to clean. Just dip it in a bowl of uh, hot water and get some uh, wire wool on it. And it'll come up beautifully and shiny like that. So our next job, actually, is to clean all the fat and gunk off of this stuff. These things, they always follow the same routine, really. I mean, you just disassemble everything, give everything a clean. We're going to replace all the worn out stuff and put it all back together. So everything's had a nice clean to it. So it's all nice and shiny. All that grease is gone. It really makes a difference. Now, when I took these plates off, I noticed there was a little bit of silver paint there, actually. So I might repaint those for them so they're nice and silvery. Got a bit of chrome spray, uh, spray paint. But the main thing, obviously, is this control stuff. There we go. That's what I'm looking for. This old mechanical stuff's had its use, really, and it is time to replace it. And we're going to replace it with a pit controller, a nice thermocouple, and a solid-state relay. 
Now all these things are matched. This PID controller has its range from 0 to 400 degrees centigrade. Same thing with the K-type. And it matters actually, because if you get a PID controller at 0 to 1300 degrees centigrade, then in its lower range, in that 0 to 200 range, it's actually reasonably inaccurate. They're always inaccurate in the lower part of the range, and they get more accurate the further up you go. So we're going to be cooking, or the guys are going to be cooking in fat. It's not going to go more than 400, or the thing will burst into flames. So we want a degree of control at the bottom end, and we're not going to go up too high. So I chose a pig controller that's not to 400, and that means sort of that first 50 degrees or so, it's going to be a bit inaccurate. But around about that sort of 100 to 250 degree range, it's going to have nice accuracy for them. Now, we have got rid of the safety mechanisms, so we do need to put the safety mechanisms back in. And one of the things we're going to do is put a thermal cutout switch in. And these thermal cutout switches uh, arrive in, in a, a package, either circular or a lozenge shape like this one here. And they're rated for the temperature at which you want them to cut out. So these ones are actually for uh, heating mats. So the cutout on this one is 40 degrees C. So once whatever this is touching reaches 40 degrees C, this is just a little switch in here. It's a biometallic strip. It'll open. It's an emergency cutout. And we're going to put a cutout switch in here as the circular ones that I actually got from a microwave oven. And the cutout temperature on that is 350 degrees centigrade. So if it gets above that temperature, it will just automatically cut out. And you put that in the live so that it's like an emergency switch. The other thing we're going to need to add, obviously, is this thing, which is what did the thermal cutout before, had a probe for the we're going to replace with our thermal cutout switch and an emergency shut-off switch. So we're going to separate that item into two items, a thermal cutout and a separate emergency switch. And that's because it's going to be used in a commercial environment again, so we need to add those features. So that's all we're going to do. So now what I'm going to do is reassemble all of this and get the electronics in place. A little bit of painting, a little bit of hole cutting. Okay, so there it is back together. Now I've cleaned everything and I've tried to preserve what I can. So where I put the pig controller, I've actually taken this control out and made it part of the decoration. So just trying to sort of preserve it, make it look balanced still, make it look pretty. Um, they did have, remember, the emergency switch at the back, which seemed really weird to me, because if you've got an emergency here and you're trying to lean at the back to try and get it, that didn't seem to be sensible. So I bought an IP-rated enclosure for it, because obviously it's a fat fryer, so we've got an IP-rated enclosure, and now the on-off switch and the kill switch are going to be at the front just down there, so that's actually going to be there. And that seems much more reasonable to me. Now the on switch was this control here, and we've replaced the on switch with an actual on switch. So that will be in there, that will be wired up, and I'll do a wiring diagram for it, because they're, they're really incredibly simple, hey? I mean, a solid state relay is just a switch that takes its control from the PID controller. So the PID controller sends an on-off control into uh, three or four. And then that actually activates one and two, which are the main power feeds going to the heat, uh, going to the actual heaters. So all you really do is follow the diagram on the back of the PID controller, wire in the uh, solid state relay, wire in the um, thermocouple, just like it says on the picture, and that's all there is to it. And we've gone through that on different uh, videos where we've done kilns. So the wiring of this is no different to the wiring of a kiln. Obviously, it's a little different with this switch, but these switches actually, are, again, <laughs> all this stuff has pictures on the back. So you just wire it according to the picture on the back and you're done. The only other thing we still need to do is this thing. This is a bit of a weird little thing. This is a um, thermocouple, actually. It's a bimetallic strip and it's contained in this case. There's a little heat contact there. You put that against the bowl and then you wire the live in and out of that. So. If this whole thing goes crazy and it starts to get hot, then the little bimetallic strip is set at a temperature that you buy these at. And you can buy these at a whole range of temperatures. Now, I've been told by the guys who are going to use this, they're going to use uh, rapeseed oil. The smoke temperature of rapeseed oil is 230 degrees. So we want this to cut off round about 220 to 240 degrees centigrade, something round about there. So you buy that to cut off at that temperature. Fit it to the bowl, it's got a couple of little screws so it can uh, fit quite closely. And if that temperature goes up, then this will just turn it off. And like I say, it's, it's very mechanical because it's just a bimetallic strip, so there's nothing really that's going to go wrong with this, and that's your safety switch. So that safety switch gets wired in the live, connected to the bowl. 
we wire up the switches, we wire up this in accordance to the diagram, and we're done. Anyway, I'm going to get that wiring done and show you the wiring. So because we want a um, stop-start button, and we've moved that to the front, what we're going to use is this thing. Now this is universally used for stopping and starting machinery, but they're momentary switches, so you press them, they don't latch, you just open them up again, because you can't really fry food with your thumb on that button all of the time, hoping that it's going to work. So what we use is something called a relay latching circuit, and it looks like this. Now you'll have noticed that one of the switches is normally closed and one of the switches is normally open. The normally closed switch is always the um, off switch. In our case, normally closed is this red one and it says on it, normally closed. The green one's the normally open one. So when we press the normally open one, we close a circuit and that provides power to the relay which then latches. Now because one of the sets of the relay is dedicated to this, it stays latched because the coil stays energised until you press the red one, which breaks that, and so the coil loses its power and it turns off. Now obviously what you need is a relay. We have one here. This relay is a double pole, double throw. So there are two available poles and we need two available poles. And we use the normally open side of the poles and connect it to this relay. So this relay has two available ports, which we obviously need, and a timer. Now I like this timer, because this timer only allows the thing to be on for 30 minutes. After 30 minutes, it's gonna turn off anyway. So it's another safety feature. Now you can get these in hours. I like the minutes one. If the guys are um, upset by the minutes, then you just have to pull it out and put a new relay in because the relays are uh, universal in their junctions. They always wire up the same way, so they can always replace this. But I'm putting a 30 minute one in. So the fryer can only be on for 30 minutes at any particular time. As they plan on frying something quickly, then obviously they don't, they don't need more than 30 minutes. If they want longer, they're going to have to swap the relay. But I'm putting a 30 minute relay in it as a safety feature. And I quite, I quite like that, actually. So we're going to use this relay. We're going to use that latching circuit that I showed you before. And we're going to use these momentary switches on the front. And that's how we'll perform that on-off function. Now, that function is performed in that way for a whole host of machinery. If you're looking at running motors, so lathes, drills, saws, then you have a relay latching circuit. If you've ever wanted to um, do a relay latching circuit or run your own um, saw or drill with safety, then this is the way to actually do it. So it's a tremendously useful circuit, even though it looks a little bit weird. So wiring it isn't that difficult either. We'll get on with wiring it and we'll have a look how it's physically actually wired. So here's what it actually looks like. And there's the normally closed red stop switch. There's the normally open green. Now I've used a heat resistant um, wire here, heat and grease and oil resistant actually, because it's a fish fryer. And I'm using the three colors, but I'll tape those three colors up. Actually, I put heat shrink on them to make them all one color at the end. And according to the regulations, they have to be tagged as one color. And I'll do that. But at the moment, I'm just using these so that you can identify with them. Number three takes the red wire, and that will actually come from the power. So that will go from the power and to one side of the relay pole. Not the relay coil itself, but the um, relay pole that's going to be switched. Then we've joined two and four together, as you can see. The blue wire here, that goes to the other side of the relay po uh, coil. Sorry, relay pole. And then the yellow and green wire goes to the relay coil itself. That is a live wire going to the coil. As I say, I'll tag it in red. So that's what it looks like when it's actually wired up at this end. And that's what it looks like from this side. Now the switch, remember, only operates the relay. There's no real power being drawn because it's just the relay switching off and on. And it's a few microamps. It's the other pole of the relay that operates the PID controller. And again, it's a very low power. The high power comes in when we start to switch the um, solid state relay. The solid state relay is the one that handles the high power. All of this stuff is very low power. Okay, so this is the controller wired up, and really all you do is follow the pretty picture that's glued on the side. So this is the switch to the uh, solid-state rectifier right there. That's the power supply. Uh, it's a 240 volt power supply. And there's the thermocouple, and you just put them in the places where it tells you to put them. 
Now if you're a bit more confused about this, we did go through this in some detail on building the kiln video, but if you follow the picture, wire them in and it's ready to just shove back into its place. And that's it, all wired up and ready to test. I, I can be a little anal incidentally about wiring looms. Okay, so that's now completed. So we've taken this, which uh, the boys next door had for not very much money, I think it was only a few pounds. Renovated it, cleaned it, upgraded the electronics and included some safety features. So this now, well, it's plugged in, ready to turn on. It won't turn on until I press the green button. And then that circuit latches and you can see it's staying on. The little neon came on to tell you it's on. Then that stays on until I press the red button. And off it goes. So I can set this. And that's kind of cool. So remember that latching circuit includes a timed relay. So this is only going to stay on for half an hour. They'll know because the red light will come on. Now I have actually disconnected the heating unit, the heating element at the back. But when it starts to heat, so when this is set, the amber light will come on, telling you that it's heating. And then when it's not heating, the amber light will go off, but the red light will stay on to tell you it's actually powered. So I'm quite pleased with that. And don't forget, it's got that thermal cutoff switch um, sat against the bowl here as well to prevent it overheating. So for not very much money, we've repaired this, renovated it, updated it, and given a bit of extra safety features. Um, the wiring actually is identical to a kiln wiring so if you have a look at the kiln wiring it'll show you how the PID and the uh, solid state relay was used the only difference here is that we've included that latching circuit for this on off switch so that's the, the main thing here is that we've done new is that and I've included the circuit diagram for that now all of the power is on uh, very low actually it's quite low amps it's all 240 so you do need to be careful but it is low amps apart from the solid state relay side which is the bit that runs these and that's a high amp draw anyway i found it interesting i hope you enjoyed the video and thank you very much for watching